It's John chapter 10, verses 1 to 18. I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he's brought out his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they'll, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they didn't understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there should be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up. This command I received from my father. Thank you, Jan. So as I say, this is, this is one of the, the most well-known passages in the Bible that uses the image of a shepherd to speak about someone caring for and providing for a group of people. And I want to draw, draw out some thoughts from that uh, very shortly. But before that, we're going to look briefly at another well-known passage in the Bible that uses the same image. And there's no prizes for recognizing that we're probably thinking about Psalm 23. That psalm that's provided help and encouragement and support to millions. In the, in the everyday reality of normal life, as well as in times of real challenge and difficulty. Let's just see what it says. It starts with these words. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. It starts with a simple statement of faith, of relationship. That it is God whom the psalmist, in this case David, is trusting in the one he is following, the one who is providing for him. David knows that deep down within his being. And in that place of safety and provision, David recognizes and is able to testify that he is short of nothing. Not that there's a few things are missing and it'd be good, if, but most of it is okay. He is short of nothing. A wonderful experience of security, of goodness, of, of peace, of not striving, knowing that you have everything you need. He goes on. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. There's a bit more detail here of how this shepherd cares for him. Brings him to a place of plentiful supply of food. A place where he can lie down in safety 
and confidence. That the shepherd leads him beside calm and placid streams where he can drink to his fill without any fear. The shepherd gives him good guidance along the journey of life so that David in turn can live in a way that honours God. Because of what this shepherd does in the life of David, David is, David is able to offer himself back to God and honour him. Things get a bit darker. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. There is a recognition that sometimes life is hard. And there are reasons to, to be afraid and wonder at what is going on. But the confidence David has in this shepherd means that he has no need to fear, but rather trust in the protection and guidance of the one he has chosen to follow. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. This shepherd is even confident enough to encourage his sheep to sit and eat in full view of their enemies, knowing that he is able and willing to keep them safe and for them to continue to rejoice as they experience this blessing. You may be facing enemies this week, whatever those look like to you. The confidence of David can be our confidence and say, actually, even in that context, we are safe and secure in our shepherds. The psalm finishes. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A statement of faith that the goodness of God would follow him and that he would continue to rejoice, to rejoice in the presence of God forever. The psalm is a wonderful expression of confidence and hope in God. For when things are going well, but also when they are difficult. And it's so good when we can make similar statements. When we are just so conscious of the good provision of God and are rejoicing in it. But it is also important to recognise that there are times when we don't feel like this. When problems are just pouring in on top of us. We don't know how we're going to continue. We don't know how we're going to move forward. And in other Psalms, David speaks of these experiences as well. But one of the powerful messages of this Psalm is that whatever the circumstances of life, the shepherd is always there for us. The shepherd wants what is best for us. Even if we don't recognize that, even if we don't able to experience that, at the moment. And in many ways, it is that unswerving commitment and care that Jesus is talking about in the words that Jan read to us earlier from John's Gospel. Words that focus less on the experience of the sheep, although they are mentioned, but words that really focus on the role of Jesus as the Good Shepherd. And particularly, in contrast to some of the other religious leaders of his day, and how they were behaving, what was motivating them. And we see this as one of the, the clear dividing lines between Jesus and the other religious rulers around. But Jesus starts in the, in the words that Jan read to us, not by talking about the role of the shepherd, but the role of the gate to the sheep pen. And in verse 7, claiming that he is that gate. Let me provide a bit, of, a bit of context. We may not be totally familiar with shepherding practices in the Middle East 2,000 years ago. Actually, it's fairly similar uh, today. Um, but let me explain a bit of what was going on. The idea in, in verses 1 to 6 of John 10 is of a communal sheep pen as a gatekeeper outside that pen. And the gatekeeper allows a shepherd to bring his flock into that pen and leave it there safe at night. So there's a, lo there's a number of different flocks. They come together, they sleep there, they're kept safe 
inside that pen, they're watched over by the gatekeeper, enabling the shepherds of these different individual flocks to go and have a rest, confident that their sheep will be kept safe. Then in the morning, each shepherd will come back to the, uh, to the sheep pen. They will go through the gate, past the gatekeeper, the gatekeeper letting them in, go through the gate into the sheep pen and call to their sheep. And that will result in them drawing themselves out of the wider group and just coming together as a flock of sheep for this shepherd. Because they know his voice. They recognize his voice and they follow him. It must have been an amazing, th amazing thing to see this great mass of wooliness separating and a group coming together in response to the voice of this one they trusted. And Jesus makes the point uh, in verse 5 that the sheep will not follow a stranger. They'll run away from him. And I think he's doing this to challenge the Pharisees who are listening to him. I think Jesus is being very direct to them even if they don't recognize it. Because this passage follows directly after a story of Jesus giving sight to a man who'd been born blind. This is in John chapter 9. And in the aftermath of that, challenging the Pharisees, a group of religious leaders about their unwillingness to recognize him. And here he continues his challenge, speaking about legitimacy to lead and shepherd the people of God. And Jesus is making the claim that he is the only one with that legitimacy. He is the only one who is properly able to lead and provide for the people of God. Verse 6 makes it clear they don't understand, and so Jesus tries again. And it is here in verse 7 that Jesus speaks about being the gate for the sheep. So no longer is there a gatekeeper and a communal pen with flocks gathered together inside, but the story has changed. This is a pen for a single flock. Communal pens were often sited near, near towns or, or villages where shepherds would congregate and engage one person, the gatekeeper, to look after their flocks. It was well maintained with a proper door to provide security. But sometimes, if the shepherd had taken the flock away from other people, maybe up into the hills for some good grazing that they'd found a few days before, this was not possible. And they couldn't get back to that sheep pen, and so the sheep needed to spend a night up in the hills. And there was danger. And so what they'd done is they'd built some temporary shelters. They were dotted about the, the landscape where the shepherd could take the sheep for the night. And here there was just a, a gap in the shelter for the sheep to go in. And here the shepherd would lie down in front of the gap overnight to protect his sheep from anything that would want to come in and harm them. So he is the gate for that pen. Jesus recognizes that being that person sometimes might involve the shepherd in, in danger. Maybe even having to give up his life for his sheep as he seeks to protect them from wolves and lions and thieves. This is the story, this is the, the picture that Jesus is painting that would have been well understood by the people that he was speaking to. And Jesus makes it clear that he is willing to take on that role, to be, to be that gate for the sheep, to be that one who, who protects them and makes sure that no harm can come to them. But then he goes on and switches, his ro switches the picture to another role, this, this role as the shepherd. And he speaks about knowing his sheep, about them knowing him, and being prepared to die for them. A deep expression of his love for them and his commitment to them. And this theme of laying down his life for the sheep is something that keeps coming up. It struck me very much when I was looking at this passage earlier. In verse 11, 15, 17, 18, Jesus is talking about the possibility, the, the certainty 
that he was going to lay down his life for his sheep and that he was willing and prepared to do that. Jesus makes it clear that this is not just a, a hypothetical, but this is something that he is going to do. And throughout this passage, there are wonderful things Jesus says about the shepherd and his relationship with his sheep, with the idea that there are things that apply to how these things apply to how Jesus cares for, thinks about, and provides for his people, for people like us. I'm just going to mention some of them. And as we think about these things, let's recognize and rejoice in the reality that this is how Jesus thinks about you. This is how Jesus acts towards you. This is how Jesus wants to care for you. Verse 3, he knows them by name. Every single person here and online, he knows by name. And the idea of knowing somebody's name in that context was, was you really know them, you understand them, you understand who they are and what, what makes them tick. You know them. Jesus knows us by name. He calls to us. He wants to be in relationship with us. Verse 3 goes on to say that he leads them. Something that we can experience if we're willing to be led and guided by Jesus. And as that psalm says, that shepherd would lead us into good and safe places. Verse 4, it goes on to say that the shepherd goes ahead of them. Sometimes we feel that we're going into difficult and dangerous situations. Jesus speaks about going ahead, treading that path before us, being there with us. Verse 11, Jesus speaks about being the good shepherd, somebody we can have total confidence in, somebody we can trust in, somebody who we know is there for us. And then in verse 11 and elsewhere, as I says, someone who was prepared to lay down his life for you, as we've remembered, as we shared communion together. And verse 14, he picks up again that idea of knowing his sheep. What does it mean to you this morning that Jesus knows you, he cares for you, he wants to lead you, he wants to guide you, he was prepared to lay down his life for you? It's an amazing thing as we look at the picture of the shepherd and the relationship that Jesus desires to have with us. But it doesn't stop there. Jesus speaks about other sheep that he's going to bring. This is in verse 16. And these other sheep will listen to his voice. They will become part of the flock. And this will result in just one flock. So no longer is there going to be different shepherds in the morning going into the pen and calling out their own sheep, because they'll all be owned by and following that same shepherd. And Jesus, in his day, was speaking to uh, people who were Jews, part of that ethnic community of people who had been chosen by God, people who had been chosen to be separate and to be called out to demonstrate what it means to live as God's people. And here Jesus is saying, that's great, but I'm going to call everybody else as well people who are outside of that community. So Jesus is talking about the scope of his mission. It's not just for the people of Israel, but for the whole world. And again, Jesus is contrasting what he is doing with the Pharisees and other religious leaders of his day. They were working hard to keep the people of Israel pure and not to be contaminated by those from outside. Whereas the shepherding work of Jesus is not just to protect and care for those who are already his, although we've seen how committed he is to that, but also to usher in others to join them so that they will become a single unified family under his care. So these are the two things that the shepherding heart of Jesus is focused on. Caring for those who are his, bringing new people into relationship with him and to become part of a bigger family. And we see this dual focus worked out in different situations in the life of Jesus, sometimes being worked out together, side by side. And we see this in the way that Jesus cares for people, 
but also in the way that Jesus reaches other people. In John 11, um, verse 17 to 35, the story is of a, of a man who has uh, died, a man called Lazarus, a friend of Jesus, and leaving behind two sisters, Mary and Martha. And Jesus comes alongside them in their time of grief and in their time of sadness. And he meets them separately and he says different things to them. For Martha, there are words of comfort and hope. In verse 23, your brother will rise again. But also there's words about himself, about who he is, intended to draw her into a closer relationship with him and to provide a basis for her hope. Verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Then he goes on to, to challenge her in verse 26 as to whether she believes what he's saying about himself. So there's words of encouragement. There's words of, that are designed to deepen her relationship with him. There's even words, even in her grief, that challenges her about whether she's prepared to accept what Jesus is saying to her, whether she's willing to grow in that relationship with him. For Mary, in her grief, verse 35 suggests that Jesus is simply moved by compassion and weeps with her. It is as though each person need to ex needed to experience something different from Jesus, and he responded in a way that would provide the most comfort and blessing to them. Jesus cares, but in the midst of that caring, tries to draw people into a deeper relationship with him. And on another occasion, we get this story in Luke chapter 9, Jesus sends out his 12 closest followers on a mission and ministry trip to preach, to heal, to usher in the kingdom of God. And when they return, Jesus deliberately takes them away to rest you get this in verse 10. Okay, the plan didn't work out. People followed them and, and they got back involved in, in ministry. But the intention was to enable those who had been out there speaking and preaching and demonstrating the kingdom of God, the intention was to provide them a time of rest, a time of refreshment. And here we see another aspect of being a shepherd. And this aspect is about being a fully involved and active part of the apostolic and prophetic and evangelic, evangelistic ministry of the church by supporting and seeking to restore those who are active on the front line for Jesus. So being a shepherd isn't just about caring for those who are already following Jesus. It is that. But it's also about enabling and supporting the mission of Jesus as he continues to draw in those who are not currently part of his flock. Ian referred to this a few weeks ago when Ian was preaching on the role of, of the evangelist and pointing out how Jesus modeled that so perfectly. And as he was doing that, he encouraged us to support the evangelists, to pray for them, to encourage them in disappointment, to help equip, equip them. Part of the role of the shepherd. What about us? What thoughts maybe have been triggered in your minds as we've reflected on this, this amazing role of Jesus as the gate of Jesus and the shepherd? Because it strikes me that both of them are vitally important for us today. To know that there are people around us who just want to ensure that we are kept safe and protected from harm and are committed to that. To know that there are people who are prepared and willing to come alongside us in the day-to-day -day realities of life, the good and the bad, to walk with us, to comfort us, to encourage us in our relationship with Jesus. And it is this last aspect, encourages, encouraging us in our relationship with Jesus, that we are the only people qualified to do. We can't expect this from social workers, from medical professionals, from other people we look to for support. Sometimes if those people share our faith, they can do that. But that's not their role in that context. That's something that we, as the people of God, are equipped and called to do for the people of God. 
And also it's important to know that there are people among us who are passionately, passionately committed to supporting us in the work we are doing for Jesus and to come alongside us and encourage us and bandage our wounds when we are hurt for seeking to serve him. It's a big, wide role, but it is vitally important in every aspect of church life. Are you one of these shepherds? And if so, are you willing to use this amazing gifting to build up the people of God and to help point people to Jesus and to help those who are pointing people to Jesus? And even if you're not one of those people that we look at and say, yeah, God has appointed this person with that gifting, do you recognize some aspects of that gifting within you? Some God-given ability that you can use to come alongside someone to bless and to encourage. Let's seek to recognize the shepherds amongst us. Let's seek to encourage them in, to grow in their gifting in ministry. As Paul says, so that we can all be built up and become mature in the fullness of Christ. And what Paul is doing there is saying that this role, this role of caring and enabling and equipping is a vitally important part of not just helping us to feel cared for and loved. Well, that's important. But helping us as a body of God's people to grow into all the good and perfect things that God has for us. So that's some, something of what this role is about and why it is so vitally important in the life of our church today. To be quiet for a moment, I'll pray, and then the group are going to lead us in one final song.